I wanted to start with an appreciation of, of you and your work that um, I, I, I know that many people in the room share my, my appreciation of, of not only the contributions that you've made uh, through your writing, but all that you represent in terms of really explaining in extraordinarily open and beautiful ways what the process of psychotherapy is like. And uh, I wanted to just share a moment that happened uh, in my office the other day when one of my advisees came to me and was telling me about the current site that she's starting at. And she was really feeling like the training that she was getting and the, and the models that she was expected to work in were really not where she wanted to be trained in, not the areas that she wanted to be trained in. She really wanted to focus in more of a humanistic approach. And uh, I think that there's something to be said for really trying to, uh, to offer the students of tomorrow uh, this kind of opportunity to, uh, to be exposed to this kind of work. So thank you for, for joining us. Thank you. Um, could, could I, I ask I you first? Be yes. Oh, yeah, let me ask you first, because I can't see the audience. So tell me about the audience. Who is there and how many people are there? Uh, and where are they in their training? Yes, there's about uh, close to 200 people here. Um, okay. Most of them are students. Most of them are students at William James College. Uh, I'd say about, I mean, I, about half of them probably are in their first or second year of training uh, to be uh, right. psychologists. And then there's also some other people in the room who bring some uh, more extensive experience. Okay, um, thank you. You can't see them, but they can see you quite well. All right, good. So, um, well, why don't we start? I mean, let's start from the place about, which obviously is at the core of your work, which is how, um, how the relationship, uh, the, the therapeutic relationship becomes really uh, such a, a primary vehicle of, of, uh, of healing and change for people. And um, what I thought to start with was, I, I, I know you've written a lot about sort of your focus on the here and now and how that sort of accelerates experiences of intimacy between the therapist and the patient. And you've also written about uh, the experience of, of how the, the trainee, people who are training in psychology, really need to learn how to use themselves in therapy. Uh, and you've talked a lot about what, what you've called rabbit ears. So um, I was wondering if we could start with that and have you just talk a little bit about some of your experience, uh, maybe some of how you acquired uh, your, your approach to, to working in that way, and uh, share some cases with us. Sure, I can, I can try that. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is a story that, that uh, when, I, when I first started, I finished, I took my training at Johns Hopkins, and uh, had the good fortune there to work with a, a, a wonderful psychotherapist named Jerome Frank, who was a pioneer in group therapy. And his textbook, Persuasion and Healing, was used for a number of years in undergraduate schools. But anyway, I, I started doing uh, learning a lot about group therapy. And then when I uh, joined the faculty at Stanford, uh, it was at a time that there was a, a, a kind of epidemic, if you will, a rapidly spreading interest in T groups, uh, interpersonal sensitivity groups, or encounter groups, as they later uh, call, uh, later were called. And I, I always felt that um, these had a lot to offer us. They, they taught, they worked a lot on issues in the here and now. And I decided that I would, uh, I would participate as a participant in one of these workshops. So I joined a 10-day workshop. It, they, they had them at Bethel, Maine, and in, in the West Coast at a place called Lake Arrowhead. So I was in a, uh, a tea group, and they, I was one of the um, oh about 12 members of the group. And the leader started the group. And what she said, her entire introduction was that uh, she's only got one rule for this group. We're, go we're going to be meeting three hours a day for the next 10 days. But that she would like everything that's said to be said in the here and now, period. That's all she said. 
And so there was a lot of response after a few minutes. People were stunned that that was all the introduction they were going to be getting. And some people said, you know, we're paying all the money for this kind of leadership. Uh, how on earth can we talk about we, here and now? We don't even know anybody in this group. And uh, some people were really angry at this and uh, because she was not willing to say any more. And then some people were saying, well, you know, I kind of like this silence. I, it, it reminds me of my, my times in, in meditation. I feel very relaxed doing this. And some people felt very edgy and didn't want to stay. So we had a tremendous amount of different varying responses to a single comment by the leader. So you have one stimulus, many different responses. And there's only one real explanation for that, I think is that you've got a single stimulus and you've got the 12 different inner worlds around it responding in very different ways to, to that same stimulus. Um, and so that that was a profound lesson for me. It's a, it's a real lesson for the here and now. And it's one of the things that makes group therapy so interesting is that you will see many people have different takes on the, on, on the, on the same stimulus. Uh, of course, people will say, well, you know, I'm not here to learn how to relate to such and such a person in this group. I've got problems here and here and with my boss and with my wife. But then you have to keep in mind the additional idea that the the in-therapy situation is a, social, is a microcosm. And uh, sooner or later, with all these people that you're relating with, the kinds of issues you have outside the therapy room are going to be repeated inside the therapy room. Only this time, you've got a lot of different eyes that could look at them and help you understand them. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Second thing that comes to mind is that I try to make some kind of here and now comment in almost every therapy session that I have. I want to just check in with the patient about how she or he and I are doing. Um, uh, to see what feelings they have uh, that are, are left over. Um, I saw a patient just uh, just finished about 20 minutes ago, and he was coming in for a second session, and I wanted to know how, what kind of feelings he took out of the last weeks, and um, did he have any questions he wanted to ask me? And uh, so I, I just wanted to keep asking him how he was how he was feeling that we were doing. So I will do this in one way or another uh, to to each patient that that I see, trying to trying to at some point to look at the relationship. Uh, do you feel that uh, was there a point during the session that you were feeling particularly close? or a point during the sessions you were feeling very far away? Uh, I'll check into the session in any any way that I can. Those, those are the first thoughts that come to my mind. Uh, how about um, in terms of this idea of using yourself and, in therapy as a therapist and, and this idea yeah. of, of the rabbit ears? Because I'm assuming you're, just, you're talking about scanning the room for, for moments that you can bring back into the, into the conversation in the here and now. Uh, but how did you arrive at this like in, in terms of uh, experientially? What, what, what was it that really made you feel that this was the direction you wanted to develop your therapy in, your practice? Well, it, I can give you a couple different ways of answering that. First of all, early on in my training, I was a first year resident, uh, and it was de rigueur. It was very, very commonplace and almost expected that you get into a personal analysis. So I got into a personal psychoanalysis with a member of the Baltimore Washington Analytics School. At those times, the the uh, the method was uh, was quite rigid, uh, right out of Freud. That you the analyst sat at the end of the couch. You scarcely saw the therapist, the the analyst, and she confined her comments entirely to interpretations. Uh, and there was virtually no kind of personal interchange between the two. I, I had 700 hours of uh, of analysis in that matter. And I ended up feeling this is a really bad model for psychotherapy. Uh, I don't remember all the all the various very various interpretations she gave me, but there were a couple of times that she kind of went outside of herself and and talked about that must have been terrible for you, as I told you some stories from my past. Those I remember very clearly. And it you know, and I'm sure that you have learned in in your own curriculum that 
there, there's probably no entity that's been studied more closely than the than the the type of of, of leadership the type of personality that the that the um, member is is that the uh, there's a phone call coming in is that is, uh, very strange on the screen okay but you know Carl Rogers uh, <laughs> felt that there were certain there were certain uh, variations of, of, of therapists and there were certain there are certain conditions that the therapist said in All right, I think we're now. back. She just entered the room. Uh, I got a consultant, but there were all kinds of incoming calls here. Do you know anything about that? I'm not sure. I know you guys are trying to use two different systems. Okay. So. Let's close the door and we'll continue. So, you know, there, there are certain aspects of the therapist, and I'm sure you know these, empathy and unconditional positive regard. Um, um, and, um, and the third one being... Uh, empathy, positive, unconditional regard, and genuineness. Uh, and so these three variables really uh, have, there, there must be a thousand uh, PhD dissertations that have been done with this, and they, they correlate very well with outcome. So I feel that one of the problems with, with the orthodox analytic approach is that there isn't enough of a kind of a genuine relationship that's established between the patient and therapist. The the psychoanalysts uh, set this up for a very particular reason. They, they want you to be a blank screen so that you will begin to transfer certain feelings you have about other important figures in your early life onto the therapist. So they, they want to generate transference, and that's a way that they can study the events of earlier life and the, your relationships with earlier people. I feel that, that given as much as we know about, about outcome and genuineness, that, that you're sacrificing too much that way. So, so that that's one thing. I, I I tended to feel that you need to relate more openly to the other people. And secondly, I think I had an early experience where I did a great deal of group therapy in my in my residency, and and uh, and and to me, uh, this is working in the the interpersonal theory where you learned a lot about yourself from working with other people and from working with me. So I tried to become a participant observer. I was an observer of what was happening in the group, but I was also a participant. And I tended to be, become more and more transparent and open as I went along. After a while, I was, this was a, a lot of training group for, for my students, and I, I had the practice, and this is in my textbook on group therapy, I would dictate a summary after each meeting of, of the session. And in that summary, uh, and I would mail it to the group members before the next session, uh, but in that summary, I would also put in some of the things that I said that I was very pleased with uh, what I had said, and also some things I said that I'm not so sure that these were very useful. So I'd talk about the errors that I thought I made. So I got to be very comfortable in, in d disclosing about myself and being fairly open in therapy. So I, I tend to do this a, a, a great deal, and that takes a while. I know you can't do this early on in your therapy experience, but um, is it more experience? The therapist is the more willing they are to take those kind of chances. Okay. Well, I mean, I was just thinking that maybe we could sort of extend that into a, a case example. I, I was thinking that one of the things that you've written a lot about is the idea of um, one of the ways of thinking about therapy is it's, it's the experience of, of affect and then the examination or in, an integration of that ex, of that affect um, experience and, and the examination of that experience. And um, I think that's, when I think of all the, of all the writing that you've done, the, uh, the, the chapter that you wrote in Mama and the Meaning of Life about the uh, seven lessons uh, in the stages of grief, or uh, seven advanced lessons in the theory of grief, therapy of grief. Right. Um, in your work with Irene, uh, in, that, in that 
example that you wrote, I was really struck with the role that anger played in the therapy. Uh, and not only, of course, with her anger and in the different moments when it came into the room, but also with your anger and, um, and your use of it. And I think, you know, uh, anger is such a hard subject to approach and it's, it's so hard to approach in therapy. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, that case or you know, where, where that emanated from and, and your experience of using anger, especially your anger, in therapy. Well, I, I, I personally, I've, I've been writing a memoir and thinking about it, and one of, the, one of the chapters I've written has to do with the, uh, the, the you know, my own personal experience with anger, because I feel that I, I really don't express anger very easily. Um, I, I, in large uh, uh, debates, I'm not too happy about that. I feel I have some real inhibition. And I, uh, something happened in therapy that just triggered off my thinking about anger and went back to some early events in, in my my own life where I feel that uh, uh, I, some of the roots of my own inhibitions of anger. So I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open with my feelings, but not too open with my anger. And, and I, you know, I haven't had an experience of really being angry with the patient for a long time. That patient you're talking about, Irene, I remember her very well. In fact, I still see her from time to time. She, she's a professor at Stanford and see her once in a while. And she definitely had a very great anger problem. Uh, and so we, 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 worked, we worked on that quite a bit. But uh, no, I don't find myself openly getting angry with patients. It's been quite a while since that's happened. Uh, other kinds I, I, I guess, of, uh, yeah, please. Oh, yeah, no, I was just, I was just thinking about that moment when, um, I'm trying to remember where she, where she had decided that she was letting go of her personal happiness, I think it was, and, uh, and you kind of colluded with her in that, and then she came back uh, the next session and, and really got angry at you, and then you, you got angry right back at her talking about, you know, how she could put all these minefields in the therapy and, and, uh, oh, right. you know, and and uh, that was just really jumped out at me that that was a that was a moment that was a, a really powerful and evidently it, it really deepened your relationship with her sort of counterintuitively somehow. Yes, I think I think that that is true. And there were there were minefields that she set for me, uh, and and I, I think I probably hung in there and dealt with her probably in the way that one had to do to, to make that kind of contact. Um, she, she was a person whose husband had died and was going through uh, terrible grief uh, at that time around, around that. And she taught me a tremendous amount about, about bereavement. Uh, it's, it's funny that you're asking that question because I'm, I'm writing my memoirs now and I'm up to that book, Mama, The Meaning of Life. But I haven't read that chapter again in about 20 years. <laughs> I've read the one just before that one, which is the uh, which is the opening chapter of Mama and the, and the Meaning of Life. It's the name of the story uh, about my relationship with my mother. So I can talk a lot about that particular story, but not the second one. <laughs> I think it was more just the the, the idea of, of the experience of, of using your your emotions in in the work, and I think that's a it's a challenging. Uh, aspect of our profession, and and yet, if the relationship is is primary, and and the affects in the relationship are primary, then sort of finding a way of doing that seems really really important. But but let me follow yes. that with a thought but, because. But but, but, can, ahead, but can I can I can I say something about that? Because the first story of Mama and the Meaning Life came up today in a session, so this is really okay. fresh in my mind. All right. Let's go. The first the first story is about. Uh, a dream that I had that was a, a explosive dream to me. And so the story starts with that. I know that most of you haven't read this book, but it's a very good book of stories. Uh, so the first book is I Have a Dream. And the dream is that I'm in a hospital bed. I'm very sick. That I'm, that I'm suddenly out of bed. I'm walking around through an amusement park. I go into this ride called the House of Horrors. You know, you go sit in this little car and the car begins to take you into the ride. And, and just before I enter into the darkness of the ride, which I think is, you know, a reasonable representation of death, I see my mother standing around and people outside. And I wave to her and I say, how did I do, Mama? How did I do? 
and so and and then so then I the wheels reversed and I had a chance to get out of the car and have this conversation with my mother with whom I never got along very well. So um, so that's the story. It's it's a, it's an interesting story and I was trying to work through some things with my mother. And I didn't talk to my mother for a couple of years during my adolescence. We had a, a very, very bad relationship. Okay. And uh, one of the things that she told me is that uh, I remember her saying is that she used to go visit her mother, going up to New York, baking a lot of cakes to bring her. And her brother would sometimes come along, and he would bring a bottle of 7-Up, which at that point cost a nickel, five cents. And the mother... The grandmother, her mother, would ooh and ah about that bottle of 7-Up, but never say anything about all the baked goods that she had made. And so as I was thinking about that, and I, I was, as I was writing this, I was feeling that, my God, I, I could have said something to her. I could have said, that must have felt awful, Mother, you know, for you to have gone through that. I never did. I didn't reach out to her either. But I was thinking about it as I was reading this story of, over the last few days. Okay. Today, I saw a patient for the third time, and I'm starting to hear about her relationship with her parents. Her mother is dead, but her father uh, is is a very, very uh, uh, angry, brooding, depressed man who she has to support. He's lost all of his money in a bankruptcy, so she's had to support her father, and they don't talk anymore. So I just couldn't help telling her about my experience in reading my own story and now after all these years wishing that maybe I should have done more to my mother. I should have reached out a little bit more and I could have expressed this kind of empathy for my mother. And I wanted to tell her that because maybe that would be of some importance for her. Maybe there's something she could reach out for her father and she'll have some regrets for not having done it. So I would never have done anything like this when I was a younger therapist. That's telling way too much about yourself and your own life. She had read the story. Oh, oh yes, she started the story with a dream, and the dream had to do with uh, with viewing uh, something to do with me and my mother and my wife. She had read in one of the stories in that book, so I know she had read the story. So that's, that's a piece of self-disclosure. Uh, kind of a feeling that I want to express to her. I have no doubts at all this is going to make a strong impression on her. She will think about this uh, and probably uh, be quite grateful that I shared this with her and maybe even make some sort of step in doing something different with her father. I think it'll be a good therapeutic intervention. If I were seeing you next week, I'd let you know. Okay. <laughs> well, let, since you brought up self-disclosure, why don't we travel down that road for a second. Um, so I'm thinking about um, in, in Lying on the Couch in, in that book, and, and there's one point where uh, Ernst Lash is, is sort of laying out sort of his rules of self-disclosure. And one of the things he says in there is about uh, he self-discloses at different stages, different things at different stages of the therapy. And um, I was interested in that idea of, of how you might think about you know, in your example that you just gave, for example, it's early in, it's early in the therapy, but you were comfortable self-disclosing. Uh, what kind of uh, rules or what, how do you think about that in terms of your experience of sharing yourself? Uh, I, 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 share, I share fairly early. I'm doing a lot as I'm in my 80s now. Uh, I'm doing a lot of briefer therapy. I don't see anyone for more than a year at this point. I have a couple of patients that I've, I've seen that I'm carrying on who have cancer, and I, I simply can't end. But everyone else that I start with now, I say, I'll see you a maximum of a year. And I also see a lot of people for one, two, three consultation sessions, uh, often on Skype therapy, and they're elsewhere in the world. So I will I will do a lot of that, and I, I, I will tend to be fairly self-disclosing. I'm not at all uncomfortable of, of asking people, what questions do you have of me? If there's something that they have a great deal of difficulty sharing with me, a lot of shame in telling me, uh, I'm not nearly as interested in actual the contents of what they're going to share, but I'm very interested in how they think I will feel about them. And their question may well be, well, how did you feel about me after I told you that? And I'll be very open about that. Uh, generally, I you know I feel really pleased that you're willing to share this with me. 
I, I'm not judging you. I've been through this enough times over many, many years of therapy that I don't judge my patients one way or the other. Um, so I will will often ask that question. What what questions do you, do you have of me? Uh, therapists are, and I'm sure that in the, their schooling, I'm sure in the schooling of you and the audience, you're going to be uh, getting a lot of. Uh, negative comments about not wanting to reveal much of your own life and I think that's that may be reassuring for 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 younger therapists but frankly if patients ask me about do I have children or how many children I have or did I see such and such a movie or read such and such a book that they just saw I I don't I think what there's no big deal about this of course I'll, I'll answer that we have a certain tendency I think in our field to worry about that because what will be the end of it? If we open ourselves up and become more real, then the questions will get more and more and more personal. And soon enough, you're going to find patients who are asking you personal questions about your masturbation fantasies or whatever. And so we'll be, you know, we're terrified about that. But that's not going to happen. And if it does happen, then we have this, this, this cardinal uh, asset in, in our own work in which we can immediately begin to shift to looking at process. And if that were to happen, then you simply begin to start asking questions about, I wonder what the payoff is for you in asking me embarrassing questions. You say, it doesn't happen. It's never happened in my life. <clears throat> but that's the way I would deal with it. It's obviously something that's meant to embarrass me. So, what 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 payoff do you get for that? Why? What's behind your asking me that? So, you always can rely on that kind of process and inquiry. I was thinking about um, thinking about going back to the case with Irene for a second, and um, one of the things that really struck me. Uh, in the work that you did with her was the um, the idea of uh, you know her her grief and the, and the black ooze as she called it and uh, your your ability to somehow uh, you had felt I think at one point you you said something that you didn't really feel like you had an I thou experience with her that you never felt like that close to her in some way and it, and yet when you at the, at the last session when you kind of revisited what she had felt had worked in the therapy. Her, her comments to you were was your ability to uh, to be uh, engaged with her and and the quality of your experience with her, uh, which was really the the healing component of the of of the therapy, in some way. And um, I was just thinking about you know and all the work that you've done. I mean, and I'm thinking about a lot of the students here. You know, how does one develop the capacity if one is going to work as close as you are to your patients to to hold the black ooze, or to not um, not be afraid of being present to that kind, that those parts of a person's experience. And I'm just thinking about you know the trajectory of your career, how you develop yeah. that capacity. Well, that, those are that, those are good questions, and thanks for talking more about Irene. You're bringing the story back into my mind. Yeah, she was a woman who <laughs> lost her husband. She was a, a woman who lost her husband at, at a very young age. And uh, she was uh, she was filled with rage, uh, rage at, at fate, uh, and and her her nickname amongst all of her students at the university was the Ice Queen, you know she was uh, very frigid and, and tight in that way, and her rage came pouring out. It came pouring out uh, in one session that I recall now. I hope I've gotten it straight. But I my brother-in-law had just died. And I was going to get on an airplane to go. And I told her when she came in the morning, I told her about this. And that I was leaving right after the session and that I made a later plane. But I felt it was important to see her. And she said, you, you, you damn well ought to see me today. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing patients all the time and worse things have happened to me. So she, we, we had that kind of session where a lot of, a lot of anger came out. And in a sense, it was, it was, uh, it was quite healing. But your question about how do you deal with these kind of strong feelings that you might have towards towards patients, um, I, I've got I've got a ready answer for that. I think is that one of the most important parts of your education as a therapist is that you have 
got to be in therapy. And you've got to be in therapy many times, I believe. Um, and I've handled this in a, a number of different ways. I've been in therapy several different times. The first one was only the first with that orthodox analyst. In fact, when I came upon rough patches in my own life, I almost took advantage of them to get back into therapy and try to do it with another kind of therapist. Let's see what the Gestalt had to offer or another thing. I know the next time I got in therapy was when I was writing a textbook called Existential Psychotherapy. And a large part of that book was focused on where I was looking at the, if, if we, if, I was asking myself the, the question, if, if we meditate as, as hard as we can, as deeply as we can on, on the real foundations of our being, we're, and we put aside all other, uh, all other intrusions, and uh, I wrote this book before cell phones, but all other kinds of interruptions, and just dwell on our own being. Where do we go? What are the ultimate concerns? And I, I wrote the book around four ultimate concerns about uh, death and meaning in life and freedom and isolation. But the biggest one, of course, was mortality. And, and so, uh, and I felt the only way that I could really uh, look at, at that was to begin to look at, at, discuss these with my patients, and see what they, what they could begin to teach me about confrontation with their own death. And but I couldn't find any patients who would talk about this. I didn't know how to bring it up in sessions. I do now, and then I decided, well, I'll work with patients who are facing death all the time because they are dealing with a, with a terminal illness, with a metastatic cancer. And so for about 10 years, I worked with people who were uh, uh, dealing with, with terminal cancer. And I worked uh, in groups. I started leading cancer groups. And now they're fairly commonplace, but there, 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 there was no such groups at that time. But it began really to get to me. I got very anxious. Uh, and certainly my students who were watching groups through one-way mirror hardly stayed the whole session because it touched off so much anxiety for them uh, and decided I've got to get back into therapy and I chose a therapist who I thought would, would stay with me and work on these issues. That was Rollo May who had written an important work on, on, on existence and on uh, sort of introducing us to the European existential therapist. So. Uh, so I think you should be in therapy on many occasions. My longest running therapy experience has been going on for about 25 years. I just had it yesterday, which is I, uh, 25 years ago, one of my colleagues called me and said, you know, he's thinking of getting together a therapy group or a support group for therapists. And we called about 10 people, and we started with, with 10 psychotherapists. At that point, they're all psychiatrists. Later, we, we have psychologists in the group as well. Uh, and we've been meeting once every other week for an hour and a half for all these years. Uh, it's a leaderless group. I'm not the leader of the group. The group is talking about our own issues in our own lives and certainly our problems that come up with patients. So if we have strong feelings that we have towards patients, we, we call this counter-transference. Uh, they're strong, uh, how do we deal with these? And this group has been extremely, extremely important to me. Um, so I, I urge you to, to understand yourself, to get take advantage of getting into, into groups of, of other therapists if you possibly can. Uh, and not only that, but to continue your education after you graduate with finding a supervisor and getting a group of buddies together and meeting with a supervisor for years. I've led supervision group for that period of time as well. So that's, that's the first thought that comes to my mind. Learn enough about yourself so that you don't have to, have to discuss this only with yourself. There's something, you know, um, when you're working in really profound areas like someone who's facing death and uh, you know I really I, I, I understand completely what you're saying that you have to be in touch with your own experience of that of, uh, I know when my I had a sister who passed from cancer and I know when she was in the process of dying it really required me to come face to face with my own mortality in order to be close to her and I, I just think that yep when you're going to work in this modality that it really requires a, an openness to your own experience in order to get close to people and to mm -hmm. facilitate some kind of intimacy in a therapeutic relationship. So 
just, and I know in your last book, there's numerous uh, examples of that as well. Um, right. And it's something I really appreciate and, and admire about, about your work and the way you've, you've written about it. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I have a, a, a one question that it comes to my mind. Um, I was thinking about uh, in a couple of different uh, of your di different books that you've written that you talk a lot about um, sort of going along this line that I just thought of uh, about myself is this idea of the wounded healer in some way yes. and and you talk in you give numerous examples numerous stories uh, when Nietzsche wept uh, in uh, you know the the uh, Dion and Joseph and Hesse's uh, Magister Ludi. Oh, yeah. Lots of examples of that. And one of the things that really, I think that this approach to therapy offers is that it's not only the patient who changes, but it's also the therapist who changes. And um, I guess since I have this opportunity, I, I, I wondered if you'd be willing to reflect on that, uh, some of the ways in which maybe you were changed by your patients or, or moments that really come to mind or, or stood out to you as these kinds of profound moments where you you were uh, open and and, uh, and experienced some kind of change in yourself. Well, the first thought that comes to my mind is uh, I think this is speaking slightly indirectly of the point, but I think is is, uh, is a patient, one of the very first patients I ever saw when I was a, a resident, and. Um, I, she was a person who was a catatonic schizophrenic. You don't see much catatonia now, but in, in when I started the field, this is before the major tranquilizers were out, every state hospital had rooms of uh, statue rooms where people were standing like statues and they weren't able to move. And they had severe catatonia. So I had a patient like this in my ward at Johns Hopkins. And I was assigned to work with her, and I, I met with her every day. Uh, I talked to supervisors about this, but nobody knew how to work with patients like that. So I met with her every day uh, of the week, and I'd just see her for 10, 15, 20 minutes at the most. And I just talked. It was a monologue. She never answered me. Uh, and I would just tell her what my day had been like and uh, what I had talked about, what I had read in the paper, what I had talked about with my analyst, anything like that, and just guessing at how she was feeling and how she was feeling. Well, after a few months of this, uh, I, I, I experimented with a, a new medication that just come onto the market. It no longer exists. It was called Pacatal. Uh, it was just after Thorazine came out. And... Um, and lo and behold, it had a miraculous effect on her. And within days, she was talking again. So I then had the opportunity to talk with her about the previous months that I had been seeing her and told her about how sort of discouraged I felt and how I felt I wasn't doing anything and, and, and that it was, it was perhaps a waste of time for her and for me to come in and see her every day. And she told me something, and I've never forgotten this. She, was, she said, you know, you were my bread and butter. Uh, you were my bread and butter during this time. And so I, I learned something that, that just sheer presence uh, is going to offer something. And you go through people and you feel like you're not giving them a solution to something, but you are there. You you go as deeply as they're willing to go with you. And that itself has has a healing component to it as well. Um, I'll tell you another story. This is all from this memoir I'm writing. The very first patient I saw in psychotherapy was in medical school. I was in third year medical school in Boston. And we saw patients for 12 sessions, and somehow during that period, we were supposed to present that patient to the faculty. And at that point, the faculty consisted of the faculty at Boston University Medical School, and several of whom were denizens of the Boston Psychoanalytic Society, all very stern and uh, in, in, in frightening in a way. And I listened to other students present their cases, and, and they got that eaten up alive practically by these by these uh, by these therapists. So I felt rather frightened about presenting my patient. But I my turn came. I I met with this woman named I call her Myrtle uh, for eight sessions, and I said I I decided that I was going to uh, to tell a story 
rather than just present a case and follow an outline of case presentation, present illness, past history, I decided I'll just tell the story of my meetings with her. And I told the story of my first meeting with her. And uh, the first time I met her, introduced myself, and she started off and she said, well, I, I think I need to start off by telling you that I'm a lesbian. And my response to this, remember, this was in the late 1950s, my response to this was, what's a lesbian? Uh, I, I don't know what that means. And, uh, you know, would you educate me? And so that's how we started. And so she began to tell me about her life and what this meant to her. And we met for eight sessions. She did it very well, got together, and the... Uh, the analysts at this meeting, none of them had any criticism. Nobody had anything to say, as a matter of fact. The definite sounds, they were caught up by the story, which told me that I had something special to offer, that maybe I could tell stories uh, that would get across you know, the, the heart of what the therapy relationship was like. So those are the first two things that, that come to mind. The extents to which I have been changed by patients. I have certainly was changed by my patients that, uh, that I met with when I was working with patients who were dying. And in that same book that you mentioned, Mom and the Meaning of Life, I have the story, uh, the strongest story I have of a patient who most influenced me, a patient named Paula. In, in the book, who became my kind of group leader, unofficial group leader, and I worked with her for years, and she sure changed the way that I could work with people. Uh, and I got extremely, extremely close to her over a number of years. So that's, that's, that, that, that story is the best way to answer that, that question you're asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I was also thinking, like, in terms of, you know, how our own, uh, our own histories are in the room when we work with our patients. And, and oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, one of the ways, for instance, you were writing about in lying on the couch, this, this, this idea of sort of unconscious collusion or some way where uh, we're being touched by our patients and we may, they may be touching parts of our experience that we're not even aware of. And that somehow, yeah. certainly in my experience clinically, uh, you know, I've been brought to greater awareness about my own, my own story, my own experience in some way. And, I feel like I've, I've right. grown as a human being, and I, you know, obviously, I would say that's one of the gifts of being a therapist is that you you get yeah. these opportunities to be touched by by people. And so I was just thinking about moments like that for you. Yes, I, well, there's one thing that comes to mind. Uh, it's a patient I've seen for about four or five years. He has a cancer uh, that's uh, that's very rare. He doesn't know how long he'll live. And I've been I've been working with him this time, working well, but he had extremely a uh, chaotic relationship with his father who was uh, ruthless and angry and, and uh, belittling to him. And so he had to do a lot of work. And as these years progressed, I'm really more and more aware, and he has said this himself, I'm really refathering him. Uh, I'm being a father to him, and it's been tremendously useful to him. But that's got me thinking of, you know, who has refathered me? And in the past, I often used to think I was entirely self-created uh, and how I used to long for the idea of a mentor. And there are a couple of stories I've written in this new thing I'm working on and how I was always searching for a mentor. But it made me become aware that there were several mentors around that I just didn't quite appreciate that. Uh, and maybe somehow I wanted to see myself as self-created, but they gave me a lot of mentoring and a lot of nurturing. Uh, so yeah, that's another. Uh, thanks for reminding me of that. That's th that is true. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's there's there's a lot to that, and and I guess thinking along those lines, um, since I brought up lying on the couch, you know, obviously one of the things that was very uh, I think admirable about that book was your ability to talk about. Um, sexual energy in therapy and uh, you know not only um, the obvious dangers of it which you talked about in the first part of the book with uh, Seymour Trotter but also the qualities of, of somehow how uh, Ernst Lash uh, in his ability to not only take ownership of his part of the experience with his patient but also kind of to be able to get to a level of, of honesty with this patient and, 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 as you say in the book, authenticity, that that turned out to be uh, enough for 
in that example in your story to for the patient to uh, to stop sort of concealing herself in some way and and to reach a level of self honesty and um, I'd wonder if you'd speak a little bit about you know maybe the process yeah. of that book and and some of your own own reflections on 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 that kind of experience. Oh, I'm glad you asked me about that book because that's one I just reread and so I can know it's pretty fresh in my <laughs> mind. Uh, so because that was an early that was an early book. That book is a book we were talking earlier. That book is a book about therapist self disclosure. So th that's the book and the the central core of the idea of what would happen if a therapist were to run an experiment would he where he would reveal everything about himself. He would be maximally, uh, maximally self-disclosing. Uh, so, but, the, but then the, the core idea of that, though, and, but what would happen if he were to choose as the person who he's going to run this experiment with, uh, who would be someone who was dedicated to duplicity, and in fact, really hated him because she thought he was the one who had broken up her marriage. He, he had been seeing her husband. So I've gotten into that, that, that core that core plot there, and the, the book sort of builds from there. There is a lot about sexuality in that book. At one point, my wife wrote in huge letters. She, she edits all my books, and she's my first reader. She wrote in capital letters, is there anything else you want all of North America to know about your sexual life, you know, uh, <laughs> with many exclamation, with many exclamation points at that point. Um, so, Seymour Trotter, and the, and the names in that book, by by the way, were, these were all kind of inside jokes or musings of myself because every one of the names is significant for me. The hero is Ernest Lash, but the way I thought of the word, his name was that, first of all, he's very earnest, but secondly, uh, I thought of Ulysses, and Ulysses has to be lashed to the mask so he won't succumb you know, to the lures of the siren who, who's trying to seduce him. And, and, and this book, Ernest, is attempted to be seduced by this, this patient as a way of ruining him. So he has lashed this. So that's how Ernest Lash comes to be uh, the name. And all the other names are, are names that have personal personal meanings uh, to me. So it's meant to be a, 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 a comic novel. Uh, and it's also meant to be that if you, if it's the best example I can possibly think of if the therapist stays genuine and stays honest uh, with the patient, eventually it will be a, a, of great help. Um, one of the ideas uh, inherent in this book is that old experiment that was run, I, I think, I've forgotten if I have this in the forward or introduction of that book, but there was a, one of Freud's colleagues, in fact a good friend of his, as well as an analysand, he had been analyzed by Freud, was a very interesting uh, analyst named uh, uh, Ferenzi, Shandor Ferenzi, a Hungarian analyst. Uh, he's written several books, a very interesting man. Uh, he was the one who was more willing to do research uh, rather than surely deal with deep theory as, as Freud did. So he decided one day, he used to experiment with the length of therapy, and then he began to experiment with how much the therapist could reveal of himself uh, to the patient. So he decided on a very bold experiment. He would pick a patient, he picked a therapist, an analyst that he was analyzing, and he would he would be he would treat the analyst on the couch for one hour, and the next hour they would switch places, and the analyst would treat him. So this is the maximum you can do for self disclosure. Uh, so, uh, but he wrote that. He wrote that after a few months, this is in, if you look at a book of his called, uh, uh, I think it's Clinical Investigations, I think it's called, Clinical Studies by Shandor Ferenzi. After a, th a few months, he, he broke it off. He says that it wasn't working very well, and besides, there's a whole problem of uh, therapist confidentiality, because if he's going to free associate, he might have to talk about his other patients uh, to, to, to this. Uh, and secondly, there's a problem of who pays who. Um, so, but the but the the person the and the other person who was an analyst wrote her version of it at some point, and she said she was very disappointed when it was broken off. It was going quite famously, she thought, 
And he broke it off because he was afraid he would have to admit that he was falling in love with her. So there are very different views of, of what happened in that case. But it only lasted a few months. So I, long ago, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll try and run that experiment again in modern day. So this, this, this book is sort of what comes out of, out of that ex experiment. There's a movie that's in process that will probably take years to make. It's been underway for a number of years uh, with many different options. First by Hal Ramis, the, the comedian who has written other books like The Ghostbusters. He was going to make it, and, and he died. And now another person has it, and has hired uh, the, um, the British uh, aging actor. Oh, I'm blocking on his name. The man who was in... Uh, hmm. Well, the best-known British actor that I know, an aging British actor, is going to play the role. He was in Remains of the Day, for one thing. Anthony Hopkins, it's just come to me. As you get older, it takes a few seconds later longer for the name to return. <laughs> but Anthony Hopkins is his name, and he's playing Seymour Trotter in, in that book. Uh, so maybe we'll see a movie of that uh, sooner or later. Um, I know there's a lot of questions that the audience wants to ask you. I, and before we move to that, I, I have a one question. I, I, I have a, a long-term interest in, in working with dreams. And uh, mm -hmm. I've, you know, as I've read your books and, and, and thought about some of the ways that you work with dreams, um, I really wanted to sort of explore that a little bit with you. And I was thinking about um, a couple things. Like uh, I was really struck, especially in uh, when Nietzsche weeps, there's, there's two moments to me that really jumped out uh, in, in that book regarding dreams, and especially images. And one of them was um, when, uh, when Breuer is, is uh, in his trance, and he, he's sort of going through that experience of, of, of separating from Bertha, as you call her uh, in the movie, uh, in, in, the, in the book, um, yeah. that, uh, that, the, that the healing happened in the trance somehow. And I was really struck with that. And then I was also struck with the dream that Nietzsche has um, towards the end of the book that you created for him uh, of the eight tall stones around the fire, and he starts weeping. Oh, yeah. And then right. in the next scene, in the next session, he actually weeps for the first time uh, in, right. in Breuer's present, presence. Uh, the idea that somehow I think you suggest that it's the first time he ever felt someone really, uh, really got him in, at a, in, a, in a very profound way. Um, so I'd love if you could talk a little bit about your work with dreams and, and how maybe uh, you think about that in working with patients. I, I hardly go through a single session without somehow asking about dreams. Uh, I'm very interested in dreams. And I had a dream yesterday of a patient that maybe you can help me with. It's an amazing dream. <laughs> I'm, still thinking, I'm still thinking about it. It was a very short dream. So this is a patient. This is a, a woman who... Um, about 45 year old woman she's been working with me for 11 months and is ready to stop therapy now and the dream is that she's taking a shower and she comes out of the shower and uh, suddenly she sees there's a lot of dirt in her navel and she can't get it out and she gets back in the shower to try and scrub out this dirt but it's not, it's not coming out that's all there is uh, but it was a strong dream. She had it the night before coming to see me. So we, we, we've been, we worked on this dream a little bit yesterday. Uh, and I don't know what thoughts, which, but I, I think the dream is very, I'm very interested by, by the way, uh, as you are too, I'm sure, and dreams occur the night before the treatment because often it's got to do with the treatment. You know, uh, the treatment uh, coming to see me is on her mind. It's on her mind that we're stopping. She is not finished yet. She's done a tremendous amount of work, but she's got some more to do, and I've gotten a person who's going to continue working with her. Um, so I think, and then I'm asking for any kind of free association she has. Well, no, but there's this idea of, of, of gazing at your navel. 
you know, kind of meditating on your navel. Uh, and I, so I'm thinking that it's got something to do with our therapy, and maybe it's got something to do with we haven't gotten all the dirt out yet. And, uh, and why why the navel, what that means. I mean, these are all things I'm trying to work with her maybe next week when I see her. But that, So that's, that's, that's my most recent dream that I've had with a patient. That was yesterday. Um, so so, you, so you I like focus to, a lot on free association. I will ask for free association. I'll try to ask about uh, uh, what thoughts they have. What I, I want to know what the emotion is in the dream. That's always very important. Uh, it was it a uh, was it a nightmare? Did it wake you up? Uh, if it's a nightmare, then it's you. Of course, it's a dream about death. Every nightmare is a dream about death. That somehow your life is in danger in a nightmare. Um, so, um, so I will ask this. I do not want the patient to get the idea and don't want myself to get the idea that you are going to interpret the dream. You're going to explain the whole dream. That's not, that's not the goal. What I like about dreams is they will often tell you things about what's going on between the two of you. If patients are just beginning the therapy, it's not unusual in my experience that they will have dreams about exploring new rooms in their house or taking a train ride. You know, it's something, there's something new, something exploratory that's going on. But if I get associations from the dreams and I start asking, well, what does this make you think of? Who's that person's face? Uh, you don't know him. Well, tell me who comes to mind when you look at his face. I will start hearing about people in their life that I would never have heard about before or about incidents from their past where people might be important. So for me, it's, it's, a, it's a net to go out and bring in interesting, important people to them. I, I'm, I'm not banking on solving, solving this dream, this puzzle, in the same way. I'm, I'm, I'm Having not, said that, I, though, I think... I, Having said that, I think every one of you ought to read Freud's interpretation of dreams. Read the first part of that dream and then, then read the first couple of dreams in each of the sections. I taught it for years. I had a, I had a Freud appreciation course for my residents and we read some of his major works and that was, that was one to, to start with. Uh, the course was also entitled Sometimes Freud Wasn't Always Wrong. Uh, you know, there, there are plenty of important things about Freud that we need to know in our field. When I did the research for the Nietzsche novel, and I, I needed to set that book in, in 1882, it was necessary for me because that was the year that, that Nietzsche was at his worst. He was suicidal, he sure needed help. So I wanted to try, I was my first novel, I was trying to keep things historically accurate. And I, I wanted to place it in history, so I started to think, who could he see in therapy in 1882? And the truth is, as I began to look at the research, and think, there was no therapy in 1882. It didn't exist. Freud was not just the father of psychoanalysis. He was the father of psychotherapists. There was no psychotherapy before Freud started. There were people that were doing hypnosis. There was Breuer in 1882 with a single case. Uh, and he's got to be giving credit, but he never again saw a patient in, in psychotherapy. So, yes, I did teach a Freud appreciation course for a while uh, and thought he was a, a major, miraculous figure in our time. Yeah, I, I think the other piece I was thinking about when I was reading uh, your your sort of work with with dreams, how you work them into your stories, is that it seems like there's so much, so often a comment on the process that's happening. And you know, I think so much of, of the work that you're doing and, and certainly um, the approach that you're taking is, is so much about the process itself. And there's yeah. something about, uh, perhaps we could think of it as the I, thou, or some other element that is commenting or, or witnessing the, the uh, process as it's unfolding. And, um, so I, I think I was thinking along those lines in terms of your, your well, work. That, I, yes, I too. The, that dream that I gave you about the dirt in the, in the navel, well, I think that's part of the process. This, this patient feels very grateful to me, and we have really made a, a, a major change in, in her work and her relationship with her husband. But I do think the dream has something to do with real transference. I think she, I, I'm seeing it, although we haven't discussed it, I'm seeing it as a bit of accusation. She's not happy with my stopping. Uh, there is dirt there that we haven't gotten out, we haven't cleaned, and then she may be, although she hasn't acknowledged, somewhat angry at my stopping at this point. 
So yeah, I think it does tell a lot about the the relationship. Right. Well, um, it looks like we have about a half an hour left, and I, I know the audience has a lot of questions for you. So um, I'm g going, going to read you a few, and, and uh, let's see what happens. Um, okay. The first one, the question is, um, how have you been able to help a client that cannot forgive themselves for serious past mistakes? How have you serious? Been able to help what was the next? Next to the last word, past states. Pa past. P A S T, past mistake. Oh, yeah. It's a very important question. Um, and it's very, it's a very common state. Um, I, I deal with it myself. I have a lot of regrets about not having been able to forgive my mother, not having been able to uh, to have changed my behavior to her too. So I deal with that. Uh, but I, I, I think that I have to try to help the patient understand that they're, they're merely human. Uh, what they're being so self-accusatory is something that exists in every person. Uh, uh, so I will work with it. I knew if I knew what it, what the sin was that that person is talking about, it, perhaps I could do uh, to do more of that question. But I think it, it's a, it's a common question. What what do you what regrets do you have about the past? What regrets do you have for what you have done or what you haven't done with your life comes up very frequently. Um, um, I, I like to work with with regrets. Uh, very much with with patients because um, after you work on that for a great period of time, then I like to to turn it 180 degrees on its side and say, you know, what can we do so that if we were to meet a year from now, and I ask you what regrets have you had that have built up in this next year, so what would you say? The point is really not only kind of eradicating regrets from the past, but how do you live a regret-free life right now? How do you change in such a way that you're not continually building up more and more regrets? So I like the idea of, of living in, and living a regret-free life, or a, a life that isn't going to be building up new regrets. So that's that's the best way I can approach that question. That, 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 that relates to your the idea you referenced from Nietzsche about love your fate, right? Yes, very, right. Very much. Right. Here's another question for you. Uh, can you talk about your thoughts uh, on the use of touch in therapy? What advice do you have for young clinicians uh, on themes of touch? Well, my practice is I always touch the patient during the session by shaking hands with the patient. But that's the only touch that I ever ever use with patients. There are occasions that there's been extremely moving, moving session, and the patient may want to give me a hug at the end of the session. So I will do that. It's brief. I don't repeat, repeat it or try to get into a pattern where I'm doing this at every session. It gets very awkward at that time. Uh, one of the issues is if you hug a patient at the end of the session, what's going to happen in the next session? So I, I am, I'm very careful about, uh, about, about touch with patients. I know I, there was I, a moment in, in I, with Irene where you talked about holding her hand and, and how, how important that was to her, as if she right, prevented her from right. floating off. That's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's another question for you. Um, it's two parts. Uh, are you afraid of dying, is the first part. And the second is, what do you wish you had known 50 years ago about therapy? Oh, what questions. Uh, the second question, being afraid of dying, well, uh, I don't think anyone who's, who's human uh, really isn't, isn't afraid of dying, but I'm not afraid of death or terrorized by it when the way that I was uh, back then when I first started walking, working with, with patients. Uh, 
in a sense, uh, I, I wrote a book called Staring at the Sun, and that whole book is a kind of a, a meditation on how one tries to overcome the, the fear of death. And so I, I go through many different exercises, many different ways of looking at it. There have been philosophical approaches to that. I go back to especially one of the Greek philosophers who had a lot to say about this issue named Epicurus. If ever I speak to a European audience, I say Epicurus. It's pronounced quite differently there. When I say Epicurus, nobody knows what I'm talking about there. But Epicurus uh, had a school where he taught people, and one of the things he taught that our, 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 our anguish, our anxiety, everything stems from our fear of death. So we've got to learn how to overcome the fear of death. And he had certain certain exercises that he had people go through. One of his major exercises, the one that I happen to like the most, uh, and I've written about it in that book, is is his. Um, I've forgotten the name of the exercise, but the exercise uh, has has to do with the idea, the symmetry exercise. Again, about thirty seconds it comes. The symmetry exercise. So the idea that uh, that think about the fact that you were not existent, not existent for countless years, eras. We know now for billions of years since the universe began, you were not in existence. And when you have died, you're going to be in that same non-state of being, in a sense. And so we're so fearful of the second state, and yet. It's an identical state that we've already passed through. Now, there's lots of there's been philosophical rebuttals to that, arguments about that over the centuries. There's a big literature on that. But finally, frankly, I find that a rather compelling argument, the, the symmetry argument. Um, and so that's certainly one way. Of course, I have a lot of sadness about dying, and I'm very, very much closer to any of you who are doing this, especially because I'm reminded of it very frequently with, with the death of people of my of my era, of my time. Um, uh, I find that particularly poignant as I think about writing this memoir and realizing that I don't have any witnesses of people I can ask, hey, what happened back then when I was 10 years old? There isn't anybody who I can who I can go to 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 ask about uh, to ask about that. So I've done a lot of work uh, on that, and uh, uh, yes, I'm afraid of death, but but uh, much 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 uh, calmer about it than I than I was before. Uh, and the second question is, what did I know about therapy back then that I didn't know? What, what do, do I know about therapy know? now? What do I wish I had known? I don't know. Part of the great drama uh, of my whole education was the great exhilaration in exploring and understanding, discovering these things on my own. Uh, so I think being in a state of learning about these things together was 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 great. And I uh, I'm not sure I'm a much better therapist now than I was then. Um, I feel a lot more comfortable and confident in my therapy now, but. I, I don't know how to answer that except to not to not to feel so hesitant about self-disclosure and about being a real person in in the therapy uh, ex experience. I'm, I'm repeating myself okay, there. Here's a question for you. Um, how do you think uh, how do you think the role of, what what do you think of the role of love in the therapeutic relationship? How do you think about it? The role of, I'm assuming the question is dealing with love between patient and therapist. Yeah. Well, I think that there are, are, are lots of patients, and I'll, I'll talk about therapists in a minute. There are lots of patients who really deeply love their therapist. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's 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 a, a kind of sad love because it, it it can't continue. They're they're grateful for what we've done. We've been tremendously useful in staying with the patient. I'm thinking of that catatonic patient again. So there are many patients who have a, a genuine sort of love for me. Um, 
and I I feel uh, extremely uh, connected with with the people I see. I care about them. I'm in a very privileged position, especially at this time of my life. I'm not seeing many patients. I see perhaps two to three patients a day, and so I, I know these patients very well. Uh, I, I, th I think about them uh, when I'm not with them as I ponder over some of our sessions. Um, so I develop strong feelings for patients, but it, it's not love with all the troublesome parts of love for me. There are a couple of patients I've seen who can't seem to get past, uh, get through the, the love for they have for me, and I have one who's always kind of inviting me to meet with them again, or could I appear at their book club, or could we meet for coffee? And that's that's an awkward position, but I really tell them that this is a boundary that I found to be very important in, for me and then for, for my patients or clients as well. I know I'm using the word patient, and you will use the word client, but that's just uh, <laughs> being part of the medical okay. profession. You, well, can't, you can't get out of the habit. I mean exactly the same thing as client. Well, how about in the role of love in terms of the therapeutic process itself, the healing process? What, mm -hmm. what do you imagine there? Well, what, tell you some more things. Give me a, give me some help here, and how how do we think about that? Um, um, I, I don't think of it in terms of. Well, there, there, there's some quality of the experience. I mean, I know a lot of what you talk about is the, the sort of the healing nature of the relationship. It, it, there's something about to experience a kind of closeness that you could experience in a therapeutic relationship and then to be able to extend that into your life. But, but what right. is it about right. love that is, is, is the facilitating that, I think? Well, uh, I'm thinking now this patient I've seen for several years. I'm refathering him. He has a, a great love for me. I'm, I'm very aware of that, and I've got to keep that in mind uh, as I realize his deep appreciation for me and how important I am, uh, how important I am to him. Um, but it's going to end. Therapy always, therapy always ends, uh, and this is. Uh, you, you're developing what you're helping. This is a, a, an arena, if you if you will, of rehearsal and practice. Uh, and you're trying to get the patient so they can begin to transfer over these feelings to real people in their lives. But you, you make the patient capable, uh, aware that they're capable of developing this kind of relationship. And that means that you have to try to help them know that they can do this with other people too. So I, I think that there's no end of the depth of feelings that people can have, but it's not that this is going to be the end of that. They're going, you're going to have to help them replicate this in new situations in their life. Yeah. Um, here's a question for you. Dr. Yalom, how do you feel about the focus on evidence-based treatments and telehealth? Well, okay. Um, Telebased Telebased treatments. Is that was that the question? That's correct. Uh, well, it's also the, about evidence-based treatment. Uh, evidence-based therapy. Yeah, my my the uh, last time I did a research project in the field was um, I never published this one, but I did, I thought that I had a great scheme for really looking at uh, improvement in therapy, and what I did was that I had a good clinician who later became chairman of a department of psychiatry in Melbourne, and he's an excellent clinician, and I had him interview patients at, at three times before they started therapy, uh, after three months of therapy, after six months of therapy. And we had about 40 patients, 20 in individual therapy, 20 going to the group. So I was going to look at the differences of improvement in this. So we had these three one-hour tapes of these interviews, and then I had senior clinicians in our community volunteered a day that they would come in, and they would look at all three tapes in one setting. And they would watch the first tape. They, each of them would try to outline areas of issues for that the patient wants to change in, and then what happened in three and six months. 
And so I thought it was going to be a major outcome experiment. And what happened was that there was zero order correlation between the therapists. Uh, and and they, we just couldn't get any agreement about this, where I thought we had such tremendously good data for them to see, good videotapes of experienced therapists. Uh, I didn't publish that. I couldn't get that published. You know, journals don't publish negative findings like that. But it's always made me feel very, very sort of skeptical of empirically validated therapies because of, of what the outcomes are. There's a lot of skepticism about the about the questionnaires that are used, and the more clear cut and exacting they are, I think the more superficial they are. So uh, I, I've got a lot of skepticism about this evidence of, about evidence based therapy, and the other one had to do with teletherapy, a totally different issue. Um, I've had a little experience with that more than most people because I've been supervising, acting as a supervisor of some of the therapists on uh, one of the big firms that they're doing something it's called Talkspace at this point. And this is, these are therapists who are having uh, text therapy with patients who can't afford regular therapy, but they can afford a certain fixed fee, I don't know what it is, $50, $100 a month with unlimited contact with patients during the month. And the patient will write down, text something to the therapist. The therapist will respond, not at the same time, but at some point during the next few hours. It seemed like a terrible way to do therapy to me. Uh, I mean, here I am insisting on the intimacy of the of here and now, working in the here and now to do something that was written. You don't even see the patient. I was extremely opposed to this idea, uh, but I went along with that and see to see what it was. I have been uh, very, very surprised by the fact that it's been more meaningful than I expected it to be uh, for various reasons. Uh, some patients uh, can't sit in the room with the person. They are so shy or so, so frightened of being in the same room, they prefer to do the texting. Uh, patients will uh, will text something when they're having an anxiety attack in the middle of the night. And even though the therapist isn't there with them, the therapist is seeing more raw data uh, that will, will come up. Patients who are texting will reveal things that they would never reveal to a therapist who are in real, in real time, too. So I'm having kind of interesting experiments, like interesting involvements like that. Uh, this whole texting now has changed just recently over the past couple of weeks now the the big platform is now changing it to audio where you're dictating something and the therapist will hear a, an auditory message rather than a written one if the patient so wishes and then later on in therapy some of the text therapies are are also having uh, occasional video uh, sessions so all in all I'm less critical of the possibilities of this being helpful for some patients uh, than I had originally started. The same thing goes for Skype therapy, by the way. I've had a lot of experience doing Skype therapy. I started doing this oh, some years ago as, I, as a patient requested Skype therapy, a, a patient that had moved, moved to a country that was so remote uh, that there wasn't a therapist within a thousand miles and very isolated and freezing uh, and so I agreed to, to do that with her and she, she had she, she was had online so I started texting with her and I had an astounding experience with her I thought that you're never going to be intimate with the person on the screen but it turned out that first of all she couldn't have been intimate with me if she were in the room with me because that's one of the reasons she went to this very distant continent because she was so fearful and had such negative effects of being intimate with uh, uh, with someone else. So she was escaping from human contact. She couldn't possibly have met with me. But I found that we developed a very intimate relationship as we, we went through our, our time together. I worked with her for a couple of years on, on Skype therapy. And um, it was a very positive experience for me. Now I... First of all, my work and all the books I've written are far, far better known in Europe than they are in the United States. So I have a lot of people who contact me from other continents. So I've been doing a lot of Skype therapy with people in other parts of the world. 
and uh, I'm I'm in, I'm very impressed with how effective that can be. Uh, so I'm uh, at first terribly opposed to it, and now uh, much more sympathetic with that approach to therapy. Um, looks like we have about ten minutes, so uh, let me get to a few more of these questions. Um, sure. With your philo with your philosophy, uh, how would you work with patients with personality disorders? Well, what kind of personality disorders? There are all different kinds. Uh, pick, pick one so, or two. <laughs> pick oh. one. Well, I don't work very well with people with, with severe borderline uh, disorders, and I don't see them now. And one of the ways that I'm doing therapy is I'm selecting patients who I think I can work with in a year uh, and do something for. So I'm... Uh, I'm sorry to say, to admit this, but I'm cherry picking. I'm picking patients who I think I can be useful for. And at the age of 84, I want my life to be a little bit more peaceful. So I'm, I'm avoiding some of the more, di more, more difficult patients, and that goes for sociopathic patients too. Uh, but, uh, but all the patients I'm seeing have some kind of personality disorder, whatever the, the nomenclature may be. They're, uh, they're somewhat schizoid, they uh, may be passive aggressive, they have a great deal of trouble being intimate with other people, uh, so uh, I'm working with these. I, I, I don't feel, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say this in front of young people, but I don't take the diagnostic system, the DSM-5, very seriously at all. Uh, I think that uh, it's very useful for working with uh, severe diagnoses, for making decisions about hospitalization, for making decisions about about medication, making decisions about suicide watches, etc. But for me, for the typical patients who's entering my office, I'm seeing as an outpatient, the DSM-5 is of no value whatsoever. Uh, and I don't like the way it categorizes patients here, and then you begin to see the patient in that way, uh, and so it keeps you uh, distant from patient. Uh, so I'm probably not a good person to be teaching young therapists, or maybe even having one of these sort of sessions. So I don't take it very seriously. All right. Um, here's a question. Uh, one of the greatest, uh, I think this says, one of the greatest pains a person can feel is that of aloneness. How would you go about joining with someone who feels profoundly alone? And where would you go together? No, oh, I'm working. I'm working on that uh, at all times. It comes up all the time. And the last patient I saw, the same patient just before coming here, wanted to talk about how he couldn't bear to be alone. Uh, and yet, whenever he's with people, he does. He wants to get away from them. He's always in that in that thing. So I, you know, I there's some people who absolutely cannot bear being alone, and are terribly frightened from it. And this person who I was just saying marvels at his son, who prefers to travel alone, and prefers to meet other people along his journeys rather than go with someone and therefore he's not able to, to make, meet new people and meet new friends. So it's a it's a it's a basic question. Uh, people are uh, maybe afraid of intimacy, and why are they afraid of intimacy? Well, that's that's you spend a lot of time trying trying to work on that. But more than working with that, you're living that as they become more intimate with me. And so I'm constantly checking: How does it feel for you to have said such things to me? How does it feel that you've been able to reveal so much? What questions do you have of me? How do you wonder about how I feel about you? Uh, so I, I work at that level, working with loneliness and isolation all the time. It's, it's something I'm, I'm looking at every every single hour. Uh, I, I went through a, 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 a patient uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago who got rather angry with me because she she started the question being very angry and she's an angry woman uh, and and the anger she was saying she's saying uh, you know in in our last session she said you were you said to me that I wasn't as interesting as your other patients and I never gave you any dreams and I really uh, felt very hurt and pushed away by you. 
uh, and I, I felt that you're just not happy with me as a patient. So that's the way she started. So what am I going to do with that? Well, I, I went back over the last session uh, in my mind, and I uh, and I had just been reading my notes. That, and the fact is, I didn't say that she's not as interesting as my other patients, but by God, I felt it. I really felt it, and I have to conclude that my feelings may have led me to put things in certain ways that I wasn't aware of, but she sure picked it up. So I, I said that, you know, I, I, I don't believe I said that, but the, the truth is it is easier to work with patients who will offer me dreams uh, and because she sometimes is very hard to open up. Sometimes I think of her in my mind like trying to pry open an oyster. Uh, so, so I said that I, I feel threatened by your saying this, but I have to own it. I have had these feelings that it's very hard for me to help you open up. And I know it's hard for you to do that too. But I think we're at a new level where you're being able to express this very honestly. And I'm very appreciative for you being able to, to say this to me. So we had that kind of feeling. So uh, I, I place major emphasis on what is happening between me and the person. You, you cannot just talk about lonely or being alone or loneliness or relationship without, without looking at, at the way you and that person are relating in that hour. How have we been doing this hour? At what I said, I mentioned this earlier. At what points did you feel closer or further away to me? I will say that to people all the time. And by the way, I should mention, uh, just taking a look at our process, just you and me, you know, I feel that uh, uh, you and I are doing pretty well. You're very easy to talk to. The questions are, are very uh, appropriate and, and um, making me making it very easy. I've hardly ever had such an easy interview because you're putting things in such a way that I feel Thank that this conversation... Me. Yeah, it's true. This conversation you and I could have. I'm sorry we can't continue it over dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just say I, I feel the same way. I, I, I mean, just reading your books, and I felt like I got to know you through that, and now the opportunity to actually talk with you in person is, is uh, it just really, I find it to be a, a real deepening of, of my appreciation of you. So thank you. Thank you. Let me let me, let me just do a little, little yeah. bit more self-revelation. Uh, yeah. Two nights two nights ago, I had a very bad night's sleep, and the reason was how I shouldn't be revealing this much about the reason was that just that <laughs> that night that night I had I had promised to give an interview to uh, someone from Brazil. They were going to interview me about my new book. And I had got an email just before I went to bed that night offering me a lot of questions that they were going to talk about in the interview, about 10 questions. And of those 10 questions, about seven of them I couldn't possibly answer. And they had nothing to do about my book or anything else. They were asking me questions about, can you tell me the current state of nature versus nurture in your field of psychotherapy? Can you tell me about... What are the changes in the way psychiatrists think about autism? And what is the, what's new about the causes of autism? So she's asking me these questions that I got more and more anxious during the night, thinking, how can I deal with this? And I also got rather angry about this, too. Uh, because uh, and But the other thing was I began feeling a little anxious because I feel like I'm old and I'm getting out of date. I'm not reading new books in the field. I've got some visual problems. I've had some eye surgery, and I can read on an iPad, but I don't do a lot of reading of the new current literature. None of you will either at 84, I guarantee you. Uh, so anyway, I was, feeling, I, I was feeling, I feel a little bit out of date, and I was anxious. And so uh, so I, I wrote it first thing in the morning and says, you know, our interview is later this afternoon. But these, none of these questions are about what I thought we were going to talk about, about my writing. And if you, if you, if you can't, Put it on that. Let's forget about the whole thing. As it turned out, she said, "Well, these are questions that that the various magazines I'm working for asked me." But but I I'm very pleased at answering. She turned out to be an interviewer just like you, uh, and we we talked very amiably. Uh, so but anyway, having those interviews uh, with very difficult questions was quite an uncomfortable experience for me. I'm not experiencing any of that today. So you all are being very <laughs> gentle with me. 
Well, um, we have to finish here in a minute or two, but um, okay. I don't know. Are there any parting thoughts you want to give some from students who are just starting out on their career? Are there any sort of clinical clinical reflections that you could you could share at this moment? No, I think I've, I've I focus on all the early feelings that I've had in doing psychotherapy. It's a little hard for me too because I can't see you. You know, I yeah. I am seeing you, but I can't see anyone, so it's very hard for me to say other things. But I I think I I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and and trying to pass on on information to you that I hope will be useful for you. Uh, one thing I I don't have anymore is I'm not. I am not speaking to you in ways that will make you think about how smart I am. I passed that stage many years ago. So uh, I'm trying to be as honest and open as I can. Well, I admire that. I really do. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight, and uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Before uh, before we actually close the event, um, the president of the college, uh, Dr. Nick Covino, would like to come up and just say a couple words. So, for me, thank you very much, Dr. Yalom. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to add my thanks also, Dr. Yalom. I think there are 200 people here in the room that want to go out to dinner with you tonight. So <laughs> thank you for making this a night that was for our students and for people who are committed to uh, therapy. Thank you for not making it about how smart you are, but about the work that we do. It was very, it was very, very moving for us. And I think thank that you. Uh, you have been a teacher for thousands of us. I don't know that many psychiatrists or psychologists that don't have several of your books on our bookshelf. So, Thank you for what you've been able to bring to our, our clinical practice. I want to also uh, thank Bob for what a beautiful night, huh? What a beautiful interview. So I'd like to <laughs> This is like being inside the actor's studio, right, in a, <laughs> in a consulting way. Um, thank you to Alan uh, Beck and to Stan Berman for their role in creating this night. Uh, thank you to Julie and Molly, whom you met outside, coming in for their pulling of this together. I want to say a particular thanks, not just to Bob for the gift that he had in bringing this, but for the inspiration that he had in bringing this. But he also is doing what I'm hopeful that people in the room will do. We've got an enormous crisis in our country about mental health care, right? So if we think what we know to be true, every one out of every five people that we meet has a mental illness. We've got a sleeping giant of a mental health problem. Bob said, let me use William James College as a vehicle to bring something forward. I'm hopeful as you leave here tonight, you think about the same thing. What are we going to do to make a change in this, right? Uh, but thank you all for your presence tonight. Thank you again, Dr. Yellen. Take care.